Hello, I'm Arlen. What I'm going to do today is very simple. I'm going to look at published reports of parallel adaptation of proteins, determine whether the underlying nucleotide mutations are transitions or transversions, and show that there's an excess of transitions consistent with an effective mutation bias. I'm not doing this because I'm particularly interested in parallel evolution or in transition transversion bias, which is boring. I'm interested in why evolution tends to take some paths rather than others, and I want to know how strongly a modest several-fold bias in mutation will influence the course of evolution. Transitions and transversions are defined relative to two chemical classes of nucleotides called pyrimidines and purines. A change within a class is called a transition, and a change between classes is a transversion. When we're looking at cases of parallel evolution and counting up inferred transitions and transversions, the aggregate ratio of those two always reflects both intrinsic rates of individual pathways and a multiplicity of paths that typically favors transversions. There are more transversions. Another thing to remember for this talk is that in most organisms there's a per-path bias in mutation favoring transitions. Often this bias is from 2 to 4. When evolution favors one type of change over another, we tend to see two kinds of explanations. One proposing that for changes in features that we consider important, that the more frequent change must be better on average. But it's also widely accepted that for unimportant features, neutral evolution can be biased by mutation. This dichotomy goes back to an old modern synthesis metaphor based originally on the mutation selection balance equation of mutation and selection uh, as opposing forces pushing against one each other, battling to control the outcome of evolution. Selection is usually in control, but mutation biases can affect evolution when selection is weak or absent. This metaphor of opposing pressures makes mutation biased adaptation incomprehensible. How could mutation change features if they're under the control of selection? It's hard to understand that way. If we want to understand the potential for mutation bias adaptation, we need to learn how to think differently about the issue. <clears throat> Let's imagine evolution as a process of climbing. Real climbers will plan a route to a peak, but evolution's blind, so we must imagine a blind climber, or perhaps a climbing robot, that moves by a two-step proposal and acceptance algorithm. In the proposal step, the climber reaches out for handholds or footholds. This is like the process of mutation. And then for each proposed handhold or foothold, there's some chance that the climber will accept it and shift his weight. If we impose a bias on the second step, such that the higher handholds are favored, the climber will go upwards. That's like the effect of selection. But by the same token, the climber's trajectory may be biased by the proposal process. If the climber has longer and more active limbs on his left side, then the joint uh, probability of proposal and acceptance will be higher on the left, and the climber will climb up and to the left. If the climber's on a, a, a rugged landscape, uh, he'll tend to get stranded on a local peak that is upwards and to the left. If the climber's on a smooth landscape, he'll just spiral around until he reaches to the left, until he reaches the, the peak. And if we can imagine a constantly changing landscape like this treadmill, imagine exp extending it out laterally, the climber will just continually climb to the left. I hope this way of thinking about dual causes of direction will seem obvious, but what makes it so interesting is that you won't find it in your evolution textbook because it played no role in 19th or 20th century evolutionary thought. To learn more, including the population genetics theory behind this way of thinking, check out these articles here. And while I have the chance, I'd like to acknowledge David McCandlish, my collaborator and co-author on this project, Austin Way, the high school student who did a pilot study, and Lev Impulski, a former postdoc whose work I'll mention below. So, mutation bias adaptation is possible in theory, but how do we test its real importance? Until recently, it would have been very hard to find a large enough set of cases to analyze, but now there are dozens of cases of parallel adaptation discussed in literature reviews, and most of these studies implicate specific amino acid changes that happen multiple times. To use these cases, we can simply examine them for exactly parallel amino acid changes. Some of them will be transversions, like this change here from a serine codon, TCN, to an alanine codon, GCN. That's a T to G change, which is a transversion. Other ones will be transitions. And we'll count those in two ways. For each pathway at which there are two or more changes, we'll count that as one pathway. And we'll also count the number of events along each type of pathway. And then we can combine all those results and look for an excess of transitions among known cases of parallel adaptation. And this raises the question of what counts as an excess. Because we're only looking at amino acid replacements, the universe of possibilities is defined by the genetic code. If we simply count up all the paths from one codon to another, 
we find that there's 116 transitions that result in an amino acid replacement and 276 transversions, a ratio of 1 to 2.4 or about 0 0.4. In computing this null expectation, this expected transition transversion ratio for amino acid replacements, we'd also want to take into account any systematic differences due to the exchangeability of amino acids in proteins. Some have suggested, indeed, that amino acid changes that take place by transition mutations are more conservative than transversions. That is, they've suggested there's a, there's, a, there's a bias by which selection favors transitions. In order to assess that idea, we can't just look at the pattern of, the pattern of protein evolution indeed uh, favors replacements that take place by transitions, but we don't know whether that's a mutational effect or whether it's a selective effect. In order to disentangle those two, we need to look at a measure like experimental exchangeability or Tang's U matrix. So experimental exchangeability is based on a statistical meta-analysis of 10,000 experimental amino acid exchanges in proteins. It's strictly protein level effects. It doesn't have any mutation or evolution in it. Tang's U matrix is based on a large amount of evolutionary data, but they use a method that takes the evolutionary pattern and partitions it into codon mutation and amino acid acceptability. So the mutational part is taken out and they just have a measure of, of amino acid acceptability. Those two measures are completely independent of each other and they both give the same answer. The transition transversion ratio doesn't go up. So transitions are not more conservative than transversions. If we take into account codon usage, there's not a large effect there. The numbers spread out a little bit. And in order to be conservative in testing the null hypothesis, we're just going to use the highest value here, which is 0.43. So far, we've analyzed 20 published cases of parallel evolution, shown here with the implicated taxa, the implicated genes or proteins, and phenotypic correlates of adaptation. Five of these 20 cases are laboratory studies, where, where parallel evolution took place in a laboratory setting. But most of them are based on naturally evolved changes, such as the famous cases of, of uh, changes in spectral sensitivity in, due to amino acid changes in visual pigments that have happened again and again in different groups of animals. Or the famous case of convergence in stomach lysozymes between cows and langurs. And here's some of the other cases. We've gotten data from 20, 20 cases, each of which has one or, one or more publications, and use those to look for an excess of transitions among uh, parallel adaptation events. So what's the observed bias? Well, here is the, a summary of the data with the cases shown here and separated by transitions and transversions, the number of paths observed and the number of events observed. So for instance, in the case of uh, high altitude hemoglobins, uh, there are four pathways for transitions that occur two, five, seven, and 17 times, and likewise four paths for transversions that occur in parallel two, two, three, and two times. Here's that same table simplified just to look at the, at the sums down here by pathways transitions are 80 to 63 transversions, so the ratio is greater than 1 there, and by events it's 410 to 244. So if we look at that ratio of, of pathways, 80 to 63, that's a ratio of 1.3. It's, it's three times higher than what we expect from the null hypothesis, which is a ratio of 0.43, and that's highly significant. And likewise, by events, uh, again, this is higher uh, even more by fourfold, than we expect from the null hypothesis, and it's also highly significant. So that's the main result of this study. If we look at reported cases of parallel adaptation, there's a several-fold excess of transitions, and this excess is highly significant. This excess is consistent with the pervasive effect of mutational bias on adaptation. However, we need to do some more tests before drawing a firm conclusion, because all we've really done so far is to reject the null hypothesis. So, and these are some things that are in progress, because we're sort of in the middle of this project. So one obvious step is to get independent measurements of mutation bias for different taxa and see if evolutionary transition transversion bias is higher in taxa that have a higher mutational bias. Another issue to consider is the extent to which published reports of parallel adaptation are contaminated with noise due to parallel changes that are not adaptive. There's always a non-zero chance of getting fooled by a repeated change that happens uh, between different proteins that's neutral but just happens to look like it's associated with adaptation. So one way to address this possibility is just to raise the bar. Instead of looking at pathways with greater than two changes, we can look at pathways that have three or more, four or more, five or more. And what happens is that um, we have fewer and fewer data as we, as we raise the cutoff here, 
but there's still an excess of transition, several fold. And this excess is still significant. Um, I'd also like to point out that transition transversion bias is significant in both natural and experimental studies. So there are only five experimental studies out of our 20, but they have lots of replicates, so they tend to dominate the numbers. Um, but, and, and these studies are unrealistic in some ways, that the laboratory con conditions can be seen as artificial in some ways. So uh, it's interesting to, to take those out and see what the effective effect is. And the effect of taking those out is that among the natural cases only, we still have a transition transversion bias, and it's still statistically significant. Another thing we like to do is find out what kinds of artifacts of analysis might be affecting the results, and suggestions are welcome on that. But I'd like to finish by talking briefly about a selective alternative. So I said previously that there was um, th th that transitions are not more conservative than transversions, but one could argue that we didn't look at exactly the right kind of evidence. For instance, you, you could argue that most protein changes in evolution are neutral, and so Tang's U matrix is really a measure of the chance that a change is neutral. But in cases of adaptation, we're looking at things that are, are beneficial, that are at the high end of the distribution. So what we really want to know is whether, not, not whether transitions and transversions have the same overall distribution, but what about specifically the tails of the distribution, the upper tails? The, the possibility is, logically, that transitions are overrepresented among parallel changes because beneficial transitions are better than beneficial transversions, even if transitions on average are not better than, than transversions. And of course the alternative is that transitions are overrepresented in parallel evolution because they're favored by mutational bias, and if that's the case we don't really expect beneficial transitions to be more beneficial. And under some conditions we actually expect them to be less beneficial, so the transitions that are recovered post hoc via adaptation uh, have been, our knowledge of them is acquired by a biased process because transitions have an unfair advantage in getting into the pool of adaptive changes because they've got this extra mutational push. And the interesting thing about these alternatives is that this is completely testable and the data to resolve this issue is out there uh, from experiments where, uh, where experimenters have measured selection coefficients for multiple transitions and transversions. And I've started looking at some of this data and the results are promising. All right, to conclude, Understanding the potential for mutation-biased adaptation requires looking at evolution a little bit differently. And if we do that, this leads to novel, testable hypotheses. One of them is to look for transition-transversion bias in cases of parallel adaptation. And when we look for that, we find it. We see an excess of transitions. This pattern appears to reflect mutation bias, but we need to do more tests to be sure. Thanks for listening to this talk. I welcome your comments or questions.